Two minutes, please. My name is Josh Gold from Uber. Uh, I will focus on intro 276. First, let me be clear. We do not deactivate a user because we want to. We do it because we need to. And it's always a last resort. We do it to help ensure everyone who uses Uber can have a safe and reliable experience. This means that any user, not only drivers, but also consumers and business partners can lose access if they violate our terms or community guidelines. Except for extreme situations like sexual assault, we typically provide education and notifications when incidents are detected and before we have to deactivate. We also let drivers know when their account is at risk of deactivation so they can take actions to improve and avoid it. At the same time, we know that some riders make false allegations and we have put in place systems to identify fraudulent behavior and make sure false allegations are not considered when we deactivate a driver. Drivers can always dispute a deactivation and provide additional information and context through an in-app deactivation review center. When drivers lose access to their accounts, it's usually temporary due to expired documents, the TLC active list, or other TLC regulations like maximum hours. Once the required document is approved or TLC compliance- Please talk involved, back closer to the mic. Once the required document is approved or TLC compliance issues are resolved, account access is typically restored immediately. So far this year, around 1% of drivers have faced a permanent deactivation. These deactivations were largely due to fraudulent activity and safety incidents. Drivers who are deactivated can utilize our in-app review center where they can dispute the decision and submit any additional information and have a human review it. 95% of these cases are resolved within 72 hours of submission. In New York City, drivers are also able to appeal through a process set up with the IDG and overseen by AAA. While we believe existing processes are fair and thorough, we welcome a continued dialogue on legislation. I will submit detailed written testimony but wanted to share high-level concerns with the bill as drafted. The leg I was pleased to see that the DCW pre DCWP testified that the legislation should apply to all FHV bases and medallion fleet owners. All TLC, TLC licensed drivers, not just high volume for our service dri licensed drivers, should have the same standards and protections. The bill should focus on drivers who face permanent deactivation and would have otherwise been able to drive if not for the deactivation. Um, I just, should not I, be required I'm sorry. to provide advance notice Josh, for deactivations. Sorry, I just asked that you submit it, the rest in writing, but well, we then. do have I do have questions for you, so. Okay. I'll give you another opportunity. Next person can questions for this panel. I'm going to start with Josh, just wanting to get some clarity. So in terms of Uber, does Uber monitor or review at all the complaints that come into IDG? And like, what is that, like, I guess, mechanism? Uh, so we have a process that we uh, stood up with IDG first. Sorry, can you pull that back? I'm not sure. I, you sound so low to me. Okay. Sorry. Is this okay? Is this better? That's better. Okay. Uh, we have a process we stood up with IDG, I believe, in 2016, uh, where there are uh, drivers who were deactivated uh, who come to them, uh, and they bring those cases to, to us. We review those. Um, they make cases uh, for those drivers. Um, the next step in that process is a, is a AAA overse uh, overseen hearing where a panel of drivers reviews our uh, uh, the information that we provide as well as the information the driver uh, provides through the IDG um, and that panel of drivers decides whether the driver who comes to the panel is reactivated or not. So the AAA panel that includes drivers is who makes the decision? The AAA panel makes the decision. And the, uh, the AAA is oversees the panel. The panel is just with drivers. Is only drivers? Yes. Okay. Um, who who selects those drivers? The IDG selects those drivers. So those are like the delegates. Well, to be fair, I think they recommend drivers to us, um, and we have an opportunity to disagree if, with the drivers that they recommend. What would be a case that you would disagree with? The I'm not sure we have. Okay. Or we haven't recently. So you've generally, you generally you've taken whoever they've given to be on this panel, which have been of drivers. Correct. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Could you describe what it's like in terms of the process when uh, a driver is deactivated from your app? Sure. So there are multiple different types of deactivations. One of the, the one that impacts 99% of deactivations is a compliance deactivation. Mm -hmm. The TLC keeps a what's called the 24-hour list, an active list. Those are drivers that are allowed to accept dispatches from bases or for hire services. Um, or use a, a medallion-owned taxi cab in New York. And so we do a sweep of that list every day. If you are not on that list, you are not allowed to receive a dispatch. Um, you could fail to be on that list because you failed the city-required drug test. You don't have the proper insurance documents. Um, there are multiple reasons why the TLC may put you on that list. 
um, that is the number one reason that drivers are deactivated because they have uh, either failed to be on the TLC's active list, their uh, license or insurance requirements uh, are no longer uh, valid, um, or they've hit the TLC has a maximum hours you're allowed to drive threshold. So if you've hit the maximum hour threshold, then you uh, uh, are deactivated. Those are in a bucket that I call temporary deactivations. Um, because if you are able to upload the proper insurance documents, if you are back on the TLC active list, um, if you um, no longer uh, are stuck by the maximum hours requirement, um, then you're automatically reactivated um, once you submit that proper documentation. Then there are the, the more serious deactivations and the, the much more rare deactivations. Um, so far this year, 1% of drivers have been permanently deactivated. Um, there are some situations, I, I think uh, um, service animals came up uh, earlier in the conversation, which I think is a good one. Um, there are TLC rules and regulations about when you can or cannot deny a service animal. There's also a federal decree that Uber is under uh, from a federal judge about uh, when we can uh, what we have to do with drivers who knowingly um, uh, 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 say no to a, 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 an animal that's claimed to be a service animal, use the word knowingly and claimed very specifically there. Um, and in those situations, there, are, there is not much that we can do. Um, there are other situations that are gray where there is a deactivation review center that we have internally and then there is the IDG process. No, and I, I appreciate that. And as you know, the intro number 276 is sponsored by Council Member Krishnan, um, and I know he'll have- so much majority of Brooks Powers. Um, I just have some questions, Josh, for, for you as well, uh, from Uber. Um, you know, and, and I think just taking a step back for a second, I, I want to really be very clear about, you know, there's a lot of dialogue and, and uh, you know, testimony and uh, opposing viewpoints, but I think we all can agree that we all want to have a process that is fair, that is allows for uh, drivers to have a voice in that process, to be able to make their case, and one that gives them notice and an opportunity to be heard. Um, I know that's the place that we all uh, want to come from, and uh, we all, I think, can agree on these fundamental principles. So I just had a few questions about the current process and also the, the, the um, bill that we're hearing today. So uh, firstly, you would agree, right, that it's important for drivers to have notice uh, before they're deactivated uh, of the fact of a, an impending deactivation. I think for 99% of deactivations, I think there needs to be a notice, but there are some egregious, and I use egregious because it's in the bill, yep. um, there are some egregious situations um, that could put a future rider in jeopardy sure. where, where there might not be an opportunity for notice, but um, that aside, uh, uh, notifications, warnings, opportunities for education. Uh, yes, agree. Sure, and and I'm putting aside those egregious cases as you mentioned that are in the bill, yeah. and focusing on the 99 percent of them. So, if we can agree that you know for those 99 percent of cases, notice in advance is 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 crucial. Um, what can you point to anything in the I, in the IDG process, Uber process right now that provides that requires notice to drivers before they're deactivated? Is there anything currently that requires such notice? The IDG process uh, is after a deactivation takes place, um, but we do have repeated notifications and so the IDG process is separate. It's after not, uh, a deactivation takes place. We have repeated notifications and warnings prior to a deactivation. Um, in some instances, I imagine we can improve those and would want to work with your office and others to improve on those, but we do, uh, and we have improved them over the years to add more education opportunities, more warnings, and more uh, notifications of uh, accounts that are in jeopardy of deactivation. Got it. So I think if, you know, and I know we've talked about this before as well, but if, if the process in place is starts after the fact, I think what we're trying to address this legislation is to create process before the fact. Um, and the importance of, of notice being part of that process. Um, and I know you all may be, may be providing notice in your own way too, but having a statutory process that starts before and has notice as part of it, I think is really uh, an important piece of this legislation and just a, a, a part of due process generally. 
Um, so I, I appreciate uh, hearing your feedback on that. My next question is about, wouldn't you agree that if Uber or Lyft, and you're not speaking for Lyft, but if, if I, I, for a higher vehicle company makes the decision to deactivate a driver, why would the burden, can you explain a bit about why the burden would then fall on the driver to reverse that decision? In other words, if a, a company like Uber has made a decision, wouldn't it make sense to have Uber explain its rationale and justify its decision rather than having a driver have to reverse that after the fact? So just uh, to comment on the first piece, because I, I was unable to get to it in my testimony, um, the one of the key changes that I did want to, um, you know, discuss or, or suggest or, or work mm -hmm. with you on is um, while we agree with notice requirements and creating a process ahead of time, um, we would love to discuss, you know, defining egregious uh, and what types of uh, advance notice or when our advance notice is not necessary um, or um, when our, when do advance notice, notices possibly create uh, jeopardize rider or driver safety, um, both on the rider and the driver side. So um, just want to be clear that sure. we, we agree with uh, the um, intent that notices and warnings and opportunities for improvement and education are needed, but want to make sure that I'm specific that there are some cases where that just um, may not be warranted or may not be um, in the best interest of rider and driver safety. And then on the, the other question around, uh, um, I guess, the, the burden of proof, um, there is a separate TLC oath process for your license. We are not um, taking away anybody's license uh, to drive, and that is a very thorough uh, uh, process. We're choosing, um, which we believe with good reason, um, who to engage in, 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 in business with, and um, we are trying to create as many opportunities to, to, for drivers to um, point out uh, or uh, defend allegations that were made either by riders or, uh, uh, or others. Um, we have added video and uh, audio recording. Um, we've added a deactivation review center so that information can be provided. Um, but there are some instances, again, um, those permanent deactivations, it's less than 1% of the driver population. It's uh, in the hundreds, not in the thousands. Um, and, you know, when we make a mistake, uh, it's not a statistic, it's gonna be that person's livelihood. And it's really important that we do whatever we can not to make those mistakes, but we're getting a bunch of information, we're having investigations, these are human-led processes, and then we are now providing opportunities for drivers to, pre to present as much information as they can mm -hmm. to refute any of those allegations. The one I talked about with Chair Powers, uh, Brooks Powers is um, the uh, opportunity for a driver to take a, a, a drug test when there's allegations of a drug test that we'll, we're happy to pay for. Um, but um, that is an example of one where, um, you know, there are multiple allegations. Uh, there's, one, there's, you know, drivers came to me and we discussed this and um, marijuana became legal uh, mm -hmm. over the past few years in New York. And so someone came into the car, uh, a rider came into the car, they may have smoked beforehand, they left the car, the next passenger comes in and smells that from the previous passenger and then reports that. Um, that is not a good deactivation. And so we wanted to create an opportunity for a driver to um, have, a, have a test if, that, if mm -hmm. there's three or four or five, but the burden is still on the driver to go have the test. We're paying for that. Um, but that's an instance where, you know, there were things that were happening that weren't um, where the just cause or due sure. process wasn't there. Um, and that's an, an avenue we took to try to uh, fix that. I, I guess my question more is, you know, um, obviously you've heard the testimony today um, and, and, and that's right. You know, I know, the statistics that Uber cites, but obviously there's so many drivers here testifying to uh, how they've been deactivated, can't get back on the app, and, and you've heard it. So there seems to be a disconnect there. Um, but, you know, it's, if we have, my question is essentially, if we have one process, I, you would agree, obviously, obviously that, uh, you know, everyone is in our um, legal system innocent until proven guilty, right? And, right, we would agree with that? Everyone, are, yeah. Right? And so and I don't want to say anything that would, uh, you know, there's another side of the hall. Of wait, wait, right. We're not touching that one. But I think okay. besides, besides that, um, I mean, that's, uh, that's coming up in that context, too, but innocent until proven guilty. Right. Yeah. You're familiar with that. And you go through a whole process legally where 
if you're charged with something, right, the, the process is to prove with the right burden of proof and evidence, make out why an individual um, is guilty of those charges. We don't say to the individual, you're presumed guilty. Show us, as the court, why you're actually innocent. What happens, right, this basic principle of, 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 of procedural due process is the prosecutor's office, the agency, the government, whatever it is, has to make out the case to say you're innocent until we can show beyond a reasonable doubt or whatever it may be that you're guilty, right? Can you see how in this, why wouldn't that same framework be applied here for a process that, of course, impacts a driver's livelihood, uh, can deprive them of income and support for their family? Why wouldn't we have the same standard here where we have a process and we require the decision maker, uh, Uber in this case for right now, um, why would we not require them to make out their case as opposed to saying to the driver, prove to us why you should not be deactivated? Well, I do think there's there's a couple of differences. One is it's not a, a criminal case. Um, there's uh, we're contracting with an individual and we're making a business decision to contract with that individual. But the stakes uh, are high. Sorry to interrupt. It's not a criminal case, of course, but the stakes are high, though, right? So it's like in this case where the stakes are high for the individual that's affected by the outcome, why wouldn't the process be we give you notice, we have to make out our case before the ultimate decision that, if, that has very high stakes is affected. Because in other contexts where the stakes are so high, that's what we do. Why wouldn't the same principle apply here? So I, I think what we're trying to get to is a place where um, there's a similar principle that applies. But um, you know, we have uh, sexual assault cases, for example, um, where we have spent a lot of time working with advocates yeah. who have advised. Sorry, Jonathan, uh, I just, let's put aside those because those are the egregious cases that, that are except, that are those are exceptions in the bill, right? I'm talking about the other 99% we were saying where those are not the the egregious cases um, that raise serious issues, sexual assault, whatever you know, or any other of those issues or the egregious circumstances. I'm talking about the majority of deactivations that are non-egregious well, cases. The, the the vast majority of deactivations are TLC rule driven. That's 99% of deactivations. When you're in the bucket of the 1% that aren't TC TLC uh, um, driven uh, situations, you're talking about the vast majority being egregious or accusations of egregious. Um, not the vast majority, but the majority. Um, and so um, now you're narrowing it down to uh, you know, a, a much smaller, uh, smaller group. So if you're removing um, serious safety incidences, interpersonal conflicts, if you're removing, um, you know, we just had a, a major fraud operation here in, in New York City where the uh, Southern District of New York uncovered uh, a group of about 800 drivers who were committing fraud, not only against Uber, but against the other 80,000 drivers by cutting them in line at the airports, by taking away surge trips that were due to those drivers, by driving down the utilization rate so that companies like Uber and Lyft had to uh, institute the lockouts. And so um, those are the types of serious allegations that are in the deactivation piece. That fraud case could take years to play out. Um, and so, um, you know, in a court of law. Uh, and so there are some instances where we um, want to provide drivers with as much opportunity as possible to refute any allegations. And they should be given as much opportunity as possible to refute allegations and as much warning as possible uh, to uh, um, not have to be deactivated in the first place. Um, but there are cases where um, uh, we don't believe we should wait for a court case to play out and have that same level of uh, uh, criminal burden of proof. And I think if you can just send the data, I know, you know, I think what we're talking about, are, you mentioned these the, the cases outside of the, the, the egregious instances, let's say, or the exceptions in the bill, too. Um, that the vast majority are TLC driven um, document cases. Uh, what's not clicking with me is because I've heard a lot of testimony today, we all did, from drivers who didn't have just document issues that they had. They don't, some of them don't even know the reasons why they were deactivated and they continue to be deactivated. So the testimony we're hearing doesn't match with data. So I, would you all be able to provide uh, data showing that uh, the vast majority of these cases are actually routine document TLC? Uh, uh, Initiated issues. Yeah, I'm happy to provide that data, and also if there are other, if there are folks who testified who want to go through your office, right, rather than direct to me or to the IDG or anybody else, I'm happy to work with you, your office, somebody in your office on those individual cases to walk through someone who's deactivated. I will say I did hear some testimony from from individuals in 2018, 2019, and I do think the processes were not great. 
um, and we've worked hard to improve those processes, including the drug test issue that I brought up, um, including a lot of education around um, service animal denial. Um, so if there are old cases, if someone feels comfortable talking to me, they may not. Um, they may feel more comfortable going to your office or, or the chair's office. Uh, I would love to, to you know, look into those cases uh, and figure out what was the reason behind it and if that case deserves um, to have another sure. uh, uh, hearing. And my final question is just, uh, given the process, the way that it's set up, uh, a driver is deactivated from Uber, but ultimately has to go through an Uber-informed uh, uh, process with IDG. Uh, it sounds like from the questions that Majority uh, Whip Brooks Powers had asked too, that the AAA panel that comes later, Uber has the final say on the drivers on that panel. They can object to them, uh, veto them, or they can be okay with them. What safeguards does Uber have in place where Uber is essentially acting as the decision maker up front, the judge, and the jury? What safeguards does Uber have in such a process uh, to make sure that it's a neutral process as compared to a third party agency, for example? So, uh, sorry, the process. With the, pro the process is, is Uber makes the initial decision on the deactivation, right? Yeah then it's an Uber-informed process with IDG after the fact to contest that deactivation, yeah. including going over to the driver panel, a AAA panel in the end, where Uber also gets to have the final say, or has the final say on the drivers that are part of that panel that IDG submits. Seems a process where, you know, for, for a simplistic way of characterizing it, that Uber is the decision maker up front, the judge, the jury throughout the proceeding. So given that setup, what safeguards are in place that what safeguards does Uber put in place to make sure it's a neutral and fair process as compared to having an outside third party run a process like that? Yeah, so first let me just expand on the process. The process, there's a deactivation um, that's human reviewed. There's a internal deactivation review process that's human reviewed. Then there is the IDG process and the panel of drivers, the, the process is run by AAA, which is a neutral third party. The panel of drivers makes that final decision. Um, we don't review the final decision of the panel of third uh, of uh, 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 drivers. But I guess that whole, that whole process, I'm wondering what's, what's the, what are the safeguards that Uber puts in place to ensure it's a neutral and fair process? <clears throat> we have a panel of third party drivers that are re reviewing those, those pieces, but if, Look, I think we've worked in other jurisdictions to figure out better deactivation uh, uh, deactivation policies, and I know we've been in touch with your office. Uh, uh, my, this hearing was scheduled. This bill was put on the schedule at the last minute, so my colleague uh, who had talked to your office recently is in Minnesota and dealing with a similar issue. Um, but we're happy to continue to work on legislation. We're not opposed to legislation outright. I think there are some issues we'd like to address. Uh, but I will say that we are the contracting entity with individuals, um, and um, we are making a choice to the same way a taxi medallion owner is renting a taxi medallion to someone, the same way a black car or livery base is choosing to work with someone. We are making a choice to, to work with someone and we sometimes choose not to work with individuals. Um, you know, we now pay into the unemployment insurance fund when that happens through no fault of uh, uh, their own, unlike, you know, taxi medallion owners, unlike Lyft, unlike black car bases, livery car bases, um, that unemployment insurance is available uh, uh, to drivers where um, they lose uh, work through no fault of their own. Um, but, you know, if there are other steps to take to improve the warning process, to improve the notification process, to improve the education process, and then on the back end, improve the um, process to make sure that the deactivations were reviewed properly against our policies uh, and our community guidelines, um, that's something we'd like to work with your office on. Thank, Thank you. you.